Good morning, my renegades. Welcome back to Rogue Radio. My name is Sarah Jane, and today is a Persecution Press episode, so let's just jump in the trenches and find out what our brothers and sisters in Christ are really up to and what they're doing. As always, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, links on how to reach me are down in the description below, and we also have merch. Yes, I'm going to keep on peddling my merch until you guys buy it. You guys are fucking sexy, and I want y'all to have some sexy-ass merch on your bodies. That sounds terrible. That sounds weird. But you know what? Fuck it. (laughs) I'm gonna say it. Go ahead and get yourself some merch. Hello. (laughs) I didn't even realize I was recording. Like, I pressed record, but I didn't realize that it was still going. I thought it stopped. But anyway, um, yeah, today is so cold out. I woke up and it was so cold. So I stayed in my bed. I was like, no, it's not worth it. Not worth it yet. Um, we were supposed to have some severe weather, like lemon-sized hail and tornadoes yesterday, but... None of that happened, as far as I know, uh, from where from where I stand, from where I live. So it was like kind of humid out last uh, yesterday, all day, and now it's just very, very cold. It is so cold. You, you think spring is is on its way, but then it gives you days like this, and you're like, I'm just wondering if winter's drunk, you know. All right, I have here, held in my hand, the latest copy of Voice of the Martyrs. If you guys want to get your copy, if you're interested in what uh, this organization is doing for the persecuted in different countries, go ahead. It is free. You go to vom.org, right? Give me a second. Yep, you go to vom.org. And usually they'll always have an advertisement for this. And go ahead, sign up. All you need is your address. And you'll get sent it, um, I want to say every two months. It just depends. Um, I don't think they have like a, uh, a monthly or weekly issue. It just depends on uh, what news has been relayed to them from the missionaries overseas. So it just all depends. It's like an annual type of thing. So um, it's free. It's always been free. And I love it. I I love reading the stories of these people that are going through a lot. Um, I also had gotten a free book called uh, When Faith is Forbidden. And it's about a man who um, ended up smuggling Bibles over the border um, and how he... You know, I don't haven't read it yet, but I know what it's about. <laughs> but that's also free too, so go ahead and sign up for that if you are interested in how missionary life is and how it can be explained to you in a book. Because um, I read the first chapter, not gonna lie, it was great. Anyway, let's get into this article real quick. Is there hope for Iran and North Korea? So most of us, like Timothy, who from uh, childhood was acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, we um, we have had access to scripture all of our lives, but hundreds and millions of people around the world are not and had have not had the chance to hear um, the, their Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. And millions of those who have come to Christ in restricted nations are still waiting for their Bibles. So, um, for those of you who don't know, restricted nations 
as far as I know, I don't have the map anymore. It got old. I had to throw it away. Um, restricted nations are when there are laws against having a Bible in certain nations. And I'm guessing Iran is one of them, and North Korea is also one of them. Um, yeah. There are also hostile nations, nations such as India, or um, I want to say Northern Africa, around that area. Some some of them are in the Middle East, and pe Christian people are killed. Their houses are burned. Their churches are burned down. Um, pastors are arrested, and all of that. And um, I just wanted to clear that up for you guys because that's. Um, this is what they're going through, all because they believe in Jesus Christ. Our enemy is the father of lies, John 8, 44. Um, and among his most powerful deceptions are the false hopes uh, he designs to resemble God's truth. Iran's 1979 Islamic Revolution is one of the, one of the examples of such deceptions. Um, the, Iran, the, the Iranian people, convinced of the virtue in rejecting secularism, Embrace the false hope of an Islamic theocracy. Since then, the Iranian people have suffered the failures of a false religion for four decades. Islam, <clears throat> like uh, other deistic or monotheistic beliefs uh, that deny Christ, cannot save... Um, Alright, they cannot save. Alright, anyway, um, I'm reading it wrong. <laughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, John 4, 6, 14, 6. And Islam's rejection of Christ has left its adherents mo lost without a way. So, oppressed by falsehood without the truth in danger of eternal death without the life, um, God's holy word is Iran's true hope. So, let me just say something. Um, I can't speak for Voice of the Martyrs, I can't speak for the company and what they believe in, but I want to say this for the sake of the podcast, not all people who are Islamic or who are Muslim are all the same. They are not all the same. Um, a lot of people, especially in the Christian community, will go straight to, oh, they're terrorists, they're this, they want to kill you. They call us infidels and all this other stuff. I've, I've grown up in a family that just automatically assumes that there's only one type of Islam out there. And I have just decided to not be a part of that anymore. Because I have met amazing Muslims. They are very hard workers. They are sweet, they are generous, and they are kind. And I'm not going to sit here and I don't want to say that I don't accept what the Voice of the Martyrs is saying, but I do want to differentiate here. There are people out there that fall under the category of extreme Islam. And that's what I think Voice of the Martyrs is trying to lay out, is that there is a difference between extreme Islam which we all have seen and have been told that the Muslims decided to, you know, take down the Twin Towers. We all know that that's not actually true. That did not happen. And, um, but you do see some people who do fall under the Islamic extremism that will go ahead and do suicide bombings or kill Christians, or something like that. Any um, religion can be taken to an extreme, okay? So, whether you believe that, um, like, do I believe that, you know, just regular Islam is going to bring people to, to heaven? No. But I'm not going to sit here and say to someone who is Muslim that, you know, what they're doing is wrong. Um, 
And the only reason why is because I've grown up in a church where you go ahead and you point fingers like, hey, you're serving the wrong God, you're going to hell sort of thing. And I'm like, no, there's a, de there's a better way of going about it if you really want to witness to somebody. The best way I know to witness to somebody is showing love. No one wants to be told that they're wrong with what they've chosen in their life. No one wants to be told that they're wrong. And I think the best way in showing people who God really is and who Jesus really is, is to just show love. And this is what I believe that the missionaries are doing out there, even with people who are Islam, um, who are like Muslim and who are uh, Islamic extremists. Some of these Islamic extremists have come to Christ because of the love that these missionaries have shown. So I'm not saying I disagree with the Voice of the Martyrs, but I am going to differentiate that there are beautiful, amazing Muslim people out there that are hard workers and generous and just the kindest people you will ever meet. Okay. But then there's also an extreme to that religion, which is what I believe a lot of people in the Christian community has kind of looked at and is like, well, you just want to kill us all. No, shut up. Stop. Stop. <laughs> We're not here to judge someone just because they have a different religion than you. That's not how God did it. That's not how Jesus did it. You show love. That's it. You show love. But anyway, on their former... I'm sorry. Uh, please look closely at the photo on page 13. Uh which a group of North Koreans uh, bow before a 70-foot statue uh, of their former leaders. So, the next paragraph is going to be about North Korea. Um, they are not uh, merely showing respect. North Koreans are taught that the Kim family patriarchs, beginning with Kim uh, Sung, Kim Il Sung? have become gods. The current regime, led by Kim Jong-un, which I believe is the most evil man in the world. I'm, I'm, I, I mean, hats off to Trump to actually talking to that man and actually having a civil conversation with him. But this man has created a law called third generation uh, prison imprisonment. And it's like, oh, if your grandpa committed a crime, he's in jail, and then when he dies in jail, his your your father ends up going into jail. And if your father dies in that jail, then you have to complete the years of their sentence that they haven't finished because they died. Even when you're not the one that has committed the crime. He kills Christians. He has said that Christianity is an illness that needs to be snuffed out. And there's just a whole lot of stupid stuff going on with Kim Jong-un. Listen. Um, not a big fan. Not a big fan. Um, the current regime led by Kim Jong-un, the third Kim in the secession, um, goes to astonishing lengths to restrict access to outside information. Especially with truth, the truth of God's word. Very true. We respond by using several innovative methods to smuggle Bibles and broadcast scripture across their border. We may easily fail to appreciate the plight of the lost in the restricted nations. Um, their hearts cry out for their creator and long for knowledge of their savior. Just as uh, ours do. We are, But unlike... Us, they do not have access to knowledge about Christ. The real problem in these nations is more profound than bad political leadership. Their people, thirsting for truth, uh, are left to drink from broken cisterns. Jeremiah 2.13, okay. Uh, such as Iran's radical Islam and North Korea's Jush, a cult of subverse... Sub... Subs sorry, subservience. I knew what it was. And uh, leader worship. <clears throat> so basically, the dictator of the dictators of North Korea have become gods to 
the people of North Korea. And those who want to go against that end up getting punished. Um, we must never rest as long as lost people are in restricted nations. Uh, like Hossein on page 4. Okay, we're going to get to that. Remain hopeless without uh, access to the truth, but we have an in abundance. Okay. And we must persevere until very until every Christian is in a restricted nation uh, has a Bible. Okay, that's cool. All right. All right, this next one is called A Letter from Father to Son. So uh, this is from Iran. Years ago, Hussein received two gifts that terrified him. He and his friends were talking about movies while sitting in a park one afternoon when a stranger walked up and handed him a book and a magazine. He had heard us discussing a movie, said Hussein, now 22. Uh, he had me, um, he, he asked me to take a look at a review of that movie that was printed in the magazine. When Hussein asked the man how much the magazine cost, he said he was told it was free. Uh, these are gifts from God. The man said, smiling. When Hussein got home, he started reading the magazine. After reading the review of the foreign film uh, he had seen, the, he continued reading and discovered that the magazine was a Christian publication. Then he realized the book he had received was a Bible. A book that was illegal to own, print, import, or distribute uh, in his Iranian homeland. Suddenly, he was gripped with fear. I was so scared because my family are devoted Muslims, Hussein said. My, or many um, things went through my mind that night. I wished I hadn't been given these books. Um, he got rid of the Bible and magazine the next day, but a few nights later, he had a bizarre dream about children eating books. Um, and each book looked exactly like the Bible Hussein had received. The dream nagged at Hussein for several days until he eventually uh, returned to the park hoping to find the man who had given him the Bible and the magazine, but he never saw the man again. Then, just days later, Hussein was shocked to see his brother Muhammad um, come home with a Bible of his own. Uh, Muhammad had been studying twice a week with a student named Ishan. That's a pretty name. I like that name, Ishan. Um, since recently falling behind in his college class as Muhammad was preparing to leave Ishan's house uh, after studies one night, he saw his friend's family surround Ishan's gravely ill grandmother place their hands on her and pray for her healing in Jesus' name. Um, I didn't understand them, Muhammad said, their, but their voices and words were powerful. Ishan kindly led me out while I was watching them. When Muhammad returned to Ishan's home uh, for the next uh, study session, Ishan's grandmother opened the door and cheerfully welcomed him inside. Muhammad later asked Ishan, if the family prayers uh, had led to his grandmother's healing. Yes, thank God, Ishan told him. Um, it's because of God's power and his authority, Ishan uh, then told Muhammad about Jesus, giving him a Bible when he expressed interest in learning more. Muhammad's parents were um, incensed when they discovered his Bible. Um, after demanding to know where he had got it, Muhammad's father, uh, Qadyar, and that's how we're going to say it, if I, if I mispronounce it, I'm sorry, grabbed the Bible and threw it toward a far corner of the yard. Um, he expected Allah's immediate wrath for having the book in his home. After, being, or after seeing how angry it had made his father, Muhammad wanted nothing more to do with the Bible. But in the middle of the night, he had gotten up to get a drink and noticed this, the small beam of light coming from Hussein's room. When he uh, looked in, he saw his brother sitting 
in the corner of his otherwise dark room reading. As Mohammed walked towards Hussein, uh, he noticed that he was that he was flattering, fl uh, flattening. I'm sorry, flattening the pages of the book uh, with his hands. Then uh, he realized his brother was reading the Bible. Uh, their father had thrown out of the house. Startled by Muhammad's shadowy figure uh, standing over him, Hussein shoved the Bible under a rug. Do you know what will happen if Dad catches you with this Bible? Muhammad asked him, Do you want me to get in trouble? I want to see your friend Dishan, Hussain, Hussein uh, replied, insisting that he was going to keep the Bible, but Muhammad, uh, upset by his brother's defense, ignored Hussein and walked away. Over time, and after continuing to read the Bible in secret, Hussein placed his faith in Jesus Christ. Months later, when the boy's mother was unable to have a needed heart surgery because of her diabetes, Muhammad felt hopeless or helpless uh, watching her groan in pain. Uh, as he worried about how the family would pay for his mother's uh, treatments, uh, he remembered that Ishan's grandmother had been healed through prayer. With Hussein's help, Muhammad took their mother to Ishan's home, where they received a warm welcome. Ishan's family then surrounded their mother, praying for her in the name of Jesus. Hussein was a new believer and joined them in prayer. My mother was confused at first, Muhammad recalled, but after that, um, she said that the prayers made her feel so light and happy. Uh, when the three of them... Hang on. When the three of them returned home, Kadyor uh, scolded the boys for uh, taking their mother to the Christians. Uh, it would have been better for your mother to die than for you to bring shame to the family, he yelled. Uh, their sister also shouted at them, accusing Muhammad of being, uh, of being responsible for their family's problems. Dang. Okay. Um, that week, Ishan stayed in touch with Muhammad, encouraging him to read the Bible. Eventually, the two met at their neighborhood park, and Muhammad... Uh, like his brother, came to faith in Christ. From then on, Mohammed prayed for his brother and the rest of uh, the family daily, and within the weeks, his mother was free from pain. Um, when his sister took their mother to the doctor's appointment, uh, a short time later, they learned that she had been completely healed. Uh, that night, when Kadyor uh, came home from work, Mohammed noticed that his father seemed troubled. As Muhammad approached uh, to see what was wrong, uh, he saw the Bible in his father's hands. The Bible, Kadur explained, had been a, had been gift wrapped and placed in their mailbox. Overhearing their conversation, Hussein walked over and took his father's hand. Dad, please, it's the second time you've had a Bible in your hands, he said. Perhaps God wants to talk to you. Before crumpling it up and throwing it away, please read it. Um, expecting uh, their father to explode with rage, Hussein and Muhammad held their breath. Then, after a brief silence, Hussein remained or uh, reminded, yeah, reminded Kadir about his oldest son, Muhammad, who had died. Wait, I'm sorry, it's Mahamud. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, one of his sons that is alive is Mahatmud, I think. Alright, it looked like Muhammad. This is why I have trouble reading. His other son is Hussein. Okay, and then the other one that had died, his eldest son, is Mohammed. So, okay, we're, we're, we're cleared up, right? Okay, his oldest son, Mohammed, who had died in the 1980s during the Iran-Iraq War. Do you remember when you wrote those letters to my brother to give him strength? Hussein asked his father. Um, my son never read them, Kadyor replied, crying at the memory that his letters hadn't reached Mohammed before his death. Um, he never heard my voice, Hussein hugged his father. Uh, but now uh, you have this opportunity to read God's letter to you. And hear his voice, he said. 
Despite the intense fear of punishment from Allah, Kadior uh, agreed to read the Bible at least a little bit. Um, but he told himself that he would just take a quick look because he still considered the Quran his holy book. One of the first things that Kadior read about Jesus was how he restored sight to the blind. Oh, uh, but he had a hard time uh, believing that Jesus, if he were really uh, God, as Christians claimed, could be both all-powerful and all-loving. Kadior um, had always viewed um, Allah as authoritarian and had even blamed him for taking his oldest son. When Kadior eventually read John 10, in which Jesus describes himself as a good shepherd um, whose sheep follow him, for they know his voice. He was reminded of his own childhood as a nomadic sheep herder. Uh, he remembered how deeply he cared for the sheep in his flock, and how he slept in their pen uh, when they were sick or injured. He recalled how the sheep in his uh, care followed him wherever he went and could find their way to him even when they were lost among hundreds of other sheep. Thinking of Jesus Christ as a good shepherd helped Kajor understand that Jesus loved him immensely, even more uh, than he had loved his own sheep. Um, in that moment, he saw God and a new light. That night, all my fear was replaced with trust, Kajor said. I was certain that these were God's words, a letter from a father to his son, a letter to the lost sheep um, that is seeking a secure home. That night, God brought peace to my heart and I started talking to him. Kadur felt as if God had uh, reassured him that he didn't uh, take his son, Mohammed, but um, he had sacrificed his only son to have a relationship with Kajor and his family. Uh, since then, the sorrow of losing my son has turned into a pleasant feeling of missing him with abundant love, Kajor said. Um, if there is one God who he, uh, this is who he is, and I believe in him. Oh, see it. This is what I mean when you show love to people. It's not about like preaching at somebody in the face all the time. It's all about showing love to people. Just like his two sons showed love to their father when he received that Bible in the mailbox. They didn't say, well, Jesus is the true one. Jesus is this, Jesus is that, you have to believe him. No, they're like, father, Please just read a little bit of it, and you'll see why we love Jesus. You'll see why we believe in Jesus. We'll, you'll see that the reason why we have such curiosity about, about Jesus Christ, you'll see the reason why we're so curious about it, and why we believe in it, why we pray and everything. And he started reading a story that actually pertained to his life, and that's how he got saved. The man chose to investigate a little bit, invest a little bit of time in the Bible, and that's how Jesus saved him. All we have to do is show love and God will do the rest. How beautiful is that? One morning, as Hussein and Mahatmud, I hope I'm saying that right, um, we're eating breakfast in the kitchen. Their father walked in and placed the Bible on the table. This is God's word, Kodger said. Then, after telling his sons that he had placed his faith in Christ, he urged them to read the book carefully for themselves. Feeling a new sense of safety in his, or with his father, um, Hussein, um, uh, began to openly, to talk openly about the Bible and his own love for Christ. I was so surprised, Kodger said by Hussein's knowledge and uh, found that he had um, been visiting home churches for a long time. After that, Mahatmut uh, admitted that he had also come to Christ that day. I realized that God had entered our house long ago, uh, but I hadn't been able to hear his voice. Now I can. Days later, 
uh, the boy's sister approached Mahatmut um, and asked how she could come to know God who had healed their mother and <clears throat> given their father peace. One by one, each family member came to faith in Christ, although the gift, or all through the gift of God's word, um, we really saw the power of God, Muhammad said, um, that every knee will bow before him and every tongue will declare that he is the true God. Wow. Oh, and they have a picture of Kandur. How beautiful. And he's hurting sheep. Listen, I'm sorry. I'm having I'm having a beautiful moment right now. I'm just as former sheep herder Kajur came to understand how immensely he was loved by his own good shepherd. Iranian Christians boldly and creatively share God's word despite constant risk of arrest and imprisonment for owning a Bible or even talking about Christ. You can learn more about the current need for Bibles in Iran uh, and be inspired by the testimonies. That's amazing. Okay, next story. Okay, this next one comes from India. I love India. I'm I'm sorry. I've just invested a lot in learning about India back in high school. It's just just uh, one of those things that I'll never stop loving. Um, so. This one is called The Bible to Hide in Their Hearts. The drive lasted more than four hours as the road gradually deteriorated. De wow, I can't say that word. Deteriorated from asphalt um, highway to dirt track to rocky trail before reaching the remote village of Balar. Balhar. Balhar? And the rest of the Bible distribution team uh, pulled off the road, uh, switched off the ignition, and waited. When a group uh, saw the familiar face of a local pastor approaching a short time later, they unloaded their uh, precious cargo and followed the pastor on an hours-long trek to the pre-designated location in the jungle. Upon uh, reaching the distribution site, they were greeted by uh, local Christians eagerly awaiting their first copy of the Bible in their own language. Wow. Yeah, like I said, India is a very uh, hostile nation towards uh, Christian Christianity. A lot of radical um, Hindus are out there killing Christians, but... um. The believers, some of whom had walked as far as 25 miles, joyfully received their Bibles and... Oh, sorry. And some basic instruction on how to study God's word. Uh, as they departed uh, one or two families at a time, they tucked their prized gifts into packages, baskets, or bags to keep them hidden and safe on the journey home. Since the year 2000, Balar has helped plant more than 200 churches in parts of India marked by the rise of Hindu nationalism and has helped train more than 100 more, uh, other Christian uh, workers to do the same. For the past seven years, uh, he has distributed thousands of Bibles in the hostile areas, uh, delivering more than 5,056 villages during 2022 alone. The majority of those who receive Bibles belong to house churches. See, that's the thing, man. House churches are going to become a thing. Like, not just in, like, uh, countries like India, but there's, there are going to be, there's going to be a time where, like, house churches are going to be the only churches open. Like, I just see it. It's sad, but I see it. These believers face harsh consequences from Hindu extremists of, if discovered actively practicing their Christian faith so they meet secretly in the jungle and carefully hide their new copies of God's word. Um, for many Christians in remote villages in India, access to Bibles is limited by cost and availability. And with no Bible of their own, hearing God's word is possible by during 
only during gathered worship. Um, sometimes the pastor is the only person uh, with a Bible, Balar explained. Okay, so Balar is a man, not a city. Okay. <laughs> For a second there, I thought it was the. I thought it was like a city. I thought it was a city, but it's a man. See. My apologies. They just keep it in their heart, and they heard, uh, and they heard from the pastor. And the whole week, they survive on that word. Uh, they need to wait for another Sunday to hear the word of God again. Manthan, Manthan. Let me let me see something. We're gonna call him Mathan because I don't know how to say his name. I'm really sorry. One of the believers who trekked through the jungle to receive a, a Bible from the distribution team had never owned a Bible in his many years as a Christian. Along with my family, I would attend church um, after traveling three hours deep in the forest. Dang, they have to travel three hours just to get to church. Like, that's crazy. A beautiful dedication, though. That's just amazing. Um, since we don't have the Bible, we could only hear the word at a church, but had no access to it at home in our village. I had a strong desire to teach the Bible to my family, as well as other young folks uh, at my village, but I could not due to the lack of having a Bible for myself. Another Christian, Krish, um, had long worried that his children would not grow up to be faithful followers of Christ if he could not teach them the word of God at home. Um, two of my children and I traveled to together to get Bibles. He said, we were overjoyed to receive the Bibles in our uh, language for the first time. Uh, we started daily prayers and nightly devotions. Not, not every Bible distribution goes smoothly. However, messages must be relayed back to the to, back and forth between church members, pastors, and the distribution team to confirm a safe meeting time and place. Man, it's like covert operations, dude. Like, this, this is like. This is espionage. This is crazy stuff, man. This is this is what they do. This is how serious it is just to get a Bible. I mean, in America, you think it you think it <laughs> sorry. You think it ridiculous because you could get a Bible anywhere in America if you really wanted to. But in India, they don't have that luxury. They don't have that privilege. So I don't understand <laughs> Like this, this is awesome. I mean, I'm I'm sad that they have to go through that, but like, it just goes to show how how the spirit of God is trying to be repressed and pressed back so far by not just the American government, but other governments out there. You know, it's it's crazy. But the message has to be passed back and forth between church members, pastors, and the distribution team to confirm safe meeting, time and place, and ensure that information about the Bible distribution has not leaked to anyone who might oppose it. Sometimes uh, we even reach a particular village and then get a message that the Bible distribution is canceled, Bilar said. Uh, we just turn around and wait for news of, an, of another opportunity. So, opposition to Christians has uh, increased in India during the past decade under Prime Minister Narendra Modi, um, who took office in 2014. The Hindu nationalist organization uh, Rash, Rashtriya, let, let me see, okay, Rashtriya Swayamazvikthang, the RSS, um, has seen a 20% increase in membership. The group's uh, emboldened base seeks to forcibly bring India under Hinduism. In addition, um, nine Indian states have passed anti-conversion laws, which means they can't change their uh, religion on their license. Uh, that impose heavily 
uh, heavy penalties on anyone convinced of pro... Amid this opposition, Christians in India are keenly aware of the need for Bibles. It feels like time is running out to place Bibles in the hands of those who want them uh, before the window of gospel preaching and churches operating openly is closed, Bilar said. Um, in support of his uh, concern, he cited an incident of a pastor who had been martyred by Hindu radicals just days earlier, and Bilar himself was physically assaulted after his uh, last trip to distribute Bibles. Uh, we get opposition, he said, but I can say that the persecution every time gives the result of church growth. The devil is trying to stop us, but somehow um, people are attracted to the gospel. Of course, we have our fears and experienced threats, but God is giving us more power. They cannot eradicate Christianity from India, I am sure, he continued, but uh, they cannot take Jesus from our hearts. Uh, he said uh, that while persecutors try to prevent Christians in India from receiving uh, physical Bibles, Christians can keep the Bible in their hearts. Um, since receiving the Bibles from the distribution team, local believers have seen how powerful even a single Bible can be in growing the church. One Bible placed in my hands gives birth to a house church in my village, um, Manthan said. Okay. Krish, too, expressed how having Bibles is changing his family and community. Neighboring houses are listening to the songs as well as the Word of God as we are reading together, he said. And he no longer worries uh, as much about his children's discipleship being interrupted while they are away at school. Now they have Bibles with them, Chris said, uh, which helps them to devote themselves to God in, or and, and his Word, sorry. Um, having God's word close at hand helps Christians remain faithful in areas hostile to the gospel. Just pray that we will be strong enough and faithful enough to persevere uh, for the faith of Jesus Christ. For the gospel's sake, Bilar said, for God is for us who can be against us. I strongly believe that God is for us, he continued, re uh, referring to Romans chapter 8. Uh, but the challenge for all the Christians in the world is whether we can stand for God, whether we can stand for God's truth, whether we can stand for God's love, that is the need of the hour. Christians in India continue to gather for worship and Bible study despite the efforts of Hindu nationalists below um, who eradicate Christianity and forcibly bring India under Hinduism. think Voice of the Martyrs has ever covered Israel. I mean, not saying that they never have. I'm just saying I can't recall a distinct story about Israel at the moment. But anyway. Next one is the day of darkness. The day of the darkness lifted. So, this is from Nepal. The darkness seemed to take hold of Yashada's family in Nepal when she was six years old. That's when they moved into a large Hindu temple and their father had hired um, to maintain, or had been hired to maintain and clean a nearby city. Um, in their strange new home, Yashada um, and their younger brother Paras uh, have stood in worship before the temple idols uh, for hours at a time. When we were in the temple, we used to wake up at 3 a.m., re she recalled. If we didn't wake up then, the priest would come to us and pour cold water on us, and that was quite difficult for us. 
uh, two years after moving into the temple, Yashoda's father began having seizure-like episodes, shaking so violently that he, uh, or that he becomes knock, he sometimes knocks things over. Um, eventually, Yashoda began to experience similar convulsions, and Paras struggled with illness too. Uh, their health problems continued after leaving the temple and moving back to their village, causing some villagers to openly wonder if the family had been cursed. Uh, the villagers' theory gained support when Yashada's father broke several bones in a fall from a tree while cutting firewood. Villagers were afraid to help him, fearing that uh, they could be cursed as well. Everybody in my family was just crying, Yashoda said. Um, nobody came there to help my family. But then, but then when um, Yashoda was ten, uh, she received a life-changing gift from a stranger. So the thing is, is that I know that evil spirits can also take on the form of illness or certain types of disorders. I know a lot of people won't believe that, won't, you know, accept that. That's fine. This is just what I believe. I believe that, you know, if you're in the presence of an evil spirit, because I believe that anything that is not, uh, that is not God, that is not from God, um, other religions, they, they worship demons, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Especially with Hinduism. Hinduism has 3,000 to 30,000 gods, and each of them have their own responsibility. And this god uh, in the picture has three eyes and fangs. Like, you can't tell me that that's not a demon. I was trying to pause. So when I see something like this when they get sick inside a Hindu temple, that is practicing Hinduism, Hindu practices, that worship a demon, yeah, I believe that that is a demonic spirit, either tormenting them, or that has possessed them. Whichever one it is, I'm not sure, but I will say it, it is an influence instead of a possession, as far as I know. While well, Yashoda uh, was outside her school one day. A young woman staying in a nearby guest house walked over and started talking to her. The woman who uh, was a foreign missionary told her about Jesus Christ. She shared that Jesus is real and that he is a very good God, Yashoda said. Once she uh, said that to me, I thought it was a good time to share my problems with her. After learning about the troubles Yashoda and her family had suffered, the woman con comforted Yashoda and uh, offered her a Bible in the Nepali language. Wanting to improve her English, Yashoda asked for an English Bible, uh, which the missionary gladly gave her. Uh, with Bible, or while Bibles are legal in Nepal, many people cannot afford them, and distribution is difficult in Nepal's remote mountainous areas. Yashoda treasured her new Bible. Um, she took the Bible home and secretly read it at night. The words of Christ printed in red ink were especially appealing to her. After reading Jesus' words in Matthew 6, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring um, anxious for itself. Uh, she placed her faith in Christ. When I saw the condition of my father, I had no idea how he could solve his problems, or how we could solve his problems. When I read uh, these verses, I read, Only God solves problems. Only he is our strength. Yashoda uh, read her Bible every day, and two months later she asked the missionary if she could go to church with her. The next Saturday, uh, the day on which Nepali Christians typically worship, ha, yes, I'm sorry, yes, I love that. They typically worship on Shabbat, yes, I'm sorry, that just got me happy. We all should be worshiping on Shabbat, so not Sunday, I. 
The missionary and a Nepali friend uh, took Yashoda to a church service far from her village. When the pastor asked for um, prayer request at the end of the service, Yashoda hesitated, but a Nepali woman in the congregation who knew about her father's death, uh, or health problem, sorry, requested prayer for him and Yashoda's family. I stopped to scratch my face and I tried to pause it and it ain't gonna work. Uh, when she shared about my family, you should have said, um, hang on. Then I started to cry. Everybody came and encouraged me. Eventually, you should have began uh, telling her family uh, what she was learning about in church um, and God and the Bible. And one morning, a couple of months later, her family decided to join her at church. Um, everybody prayed for our family, she said. Uh, shortly after attending the service, Yusada's father sought medical care instead of relying on Hindu priests. He was hospitalized for several weeks, and the mounting medical bills became a great concern. We were worried about uh, our future, and our family's circumstances uh, were very difficult, Yusada said. But when we read the Bible, we are not worried. Um, that was the life-changing word from the Lord for our life at that time. As the family continued reading God's word, Yashada's brother Paras uh, desperately sought healing from his own chronic illness. One night, uh, he prayed every two hours uh, that God would heal him, and the next day he experienced peace and healing. From that day... And Paras, uh, now 16, I have believed in the name of Jesus. By the time Yashoda and Paras's father uh, returned home from weeks of medical care, all four family members had come to faith in Christ. They, began, bleh, they became uh, the first Christian family in their Hindu village. Um, as the word spread that Yashada's family had become Christians, villagers mocked them, calling them cow eaters. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, and accusing them of accepting money from foreign missionaries to convert. Uh, then village leaders banned them from using the community water source. Yashada's uncle was very unhappy about the family's new Christian faith. Uh, so through personal connections with the police, he had them locked up for becoming Christians. I thought Christianity was legal. I mean, Bibles are, but okay. Um, as villagers heard uh, what he had done, a crowd gathered outside the police station to see what would happen. We were a little bit afraid when we saw the crowd, Yashada said. The four of us sat there and prayed. Wow. Wow. Um, once police interviewed the family, however, they decided the family had done uh, nothing wrong and released them. As Yashada's family uh, faced increasing pressure from the community, um, they rented a room in another city for a few months, uh, free of the daily harassment from neighbors, and they studied God's word together and grew in faith. They even began sharing their faith with others, leading more than 20 people to Christ. That's amazing. Um, after returning to their village, the family also returned to uh, weekly church attendance through their regular Bible study. Yashada, now 17, said she was uh, she has learned to focus on what what's eternal rather than here and now. Our health is so temporary she said many difficulties will be uh, will come into our life but um, they won't matter what matters is uh, are we seeking Christ's face and Paras said there is no more darkness surrounding his family before when we were in the dark we were on the on the wide road now we are on the narrow road um, it be it, it can be difficult to walk but it leads directly to heaven. So much persecution comes in our life that we uh, won't just take it easy.
Next one is North Korea, the ultimate contraband. Driven to a life of smuggling, North Koreans enc encounter God's word with fear followed by joy. So, um, Unji was a smuggler by necessity. In the mid-1990s, uh, North Korea suffered a series of catastrophic floods that uh, wiped out crops and farmland. Effects of the natural disaster were compounded by the totalitarian regime adherence uh, to a philosophy of self-reliance and limited imports, foreign investments, and international aid. Uh, resulting in starvation for hundreds of thousands of North Koreans. My God. I've never heard of such a government so cold before. Like, oh, you just need to defend for yourselves. So go ahead. You guys know how to farm, right? I want to slap Kim Jong-un in his face. I just want to slap him once. I just want to slap him once. During the match of suffering, or the march of suffering, Lord, uh, uh, as these years of famine are called, the average North Korean, specifically those uh, not in the military part, uh, the workers' party elite, had a choice to make. Uh, remain law-abiding citizens and die waiting for rations. Wow, or engage in smuggling or other illegal activities and hope to survive. Um, Unji, um, who was desperate to stay alive um, and support her family, opted for the second choice. Uh, she became a smuggler. Smuggling, however, came with great risk. While um, border police and customs officials on both sides of the North Korean-China border um, could sometimes be bribed to look the other way. Uh, it wasn't a certainty, and penalties could range from stiff fines to imprisonment in a labor camp. Um, in addition, the river-crossing terrain and weather could be um, treacherous and could be unscrupulous or could, I'm sorry, as could the unscrupulous suppliers in uh, on one side of the potential informers um, in every neighborhood on the other side. With no alternative, Unji um, accepted the dangers and began crossing the border into China, where she had relatives who would help her. Um, during her time there, she became acquainted with some Korean Christians who invited um, her to a Sunday worship service. At first, Unji was uh, disgusted at how unpatriotic the service was. Uh, she had been taught her whole life that North Korea's founder Kim Il Sung and his family should be the only focus of adoration and praise, but she stayed. The church gave uh, rice to Unji and others like her to share with her families in North Korea. Uh, so she returned to the church each time she came uh, to China to pick up her goods to smuggle. Um, gradually, she began to learn about Christianity and to take a deeper and yeah, and take a deeper interest. Okay, and. Over time, she received discipleship training and learned how to disciple others so she could share the gospel with her friends and family back home. But soon, uh, she had another decision to make. Uh, would she accept the extreme risk of smuggling Bibles into North Korea? Oof. Yep, that's a tough one, isn't it? It is tough, because once she gets caught, her whole li livelihood, her whole life... Her children. She won't be there for her children. That's crazy. Okay. Bibles are the ultimate contraband in North Korea. Getting caught smuggling Bibles into the country almost certainly leads to arrest, imprisonment, or even execution. Uh, those convicted of smuggling or processing other items of contraband can often receive reduced sentence or um, avoid punishment entirely, but 
or by offering um, a bribe. But according to many North Koreans, harsh sen sentences um, are unavoidable for merely pro possessing a Bible. Jesus. Man, look at these two fools standing in a bronze statue. They look copper. Copper statues. What the heck? No wonder people want to leave North Korea. I mean, you gotta bow to that. Good God. Listen. No man. No man. No human should ever think that they are as great as a god. Listen. If Kim Jong-ul does not repent, there's a special place in hell for that man. That's all I gotta say. I know that everybody's gonna be a... I know there's gonna be a lot of people that that are gonna be like, Oh, Sarah, don't say that. I'm going to. I'm going to, damn it. I'm gonna say it, man. Who makes... Well, I mean Saddam Hussein has, but... <laughs> Who makes a bronze statue of themselves and their father? Like, stop. You're not that special. Anyway, another smuggler who uh, came to know Christ after uh, defecting from, the, from North Korea, Dan B., uh, was warned by fellow smugglers that um, the severe consequences of being caught with a Bible... Um, they told uh, her that the man caught crossing the border with a Bible didn't even get a chance to bribe his captors. Uh, he was summarily sentenced to imprisonment and uh, in a concentration camp known as Kwanliso, where conditions are so bad that nearly 40% of the inmates die of starvation. And this is why they decided to do the third generation imprisonment, because Kim Jong-ul's just awful. Like, he knows that there's 40% of people that die in the prison camps, so he ended up making that law. I, I don't know why. Does he hate his own people? He must. Propaganda against religion and the Bible is so pervasive in North Korea that when a mention of the Bible can um, elicit extreme fear. When I first received uh, this thing called the Bible, I was terrified and suffered, um, said North Korean Christian who received God's word while walking abroad, working abroad. Um, I thought I finally was caught by the hand of evil uh, I even thought to report this person who delivered it to me to authorities. Ultimately, Anji decided to accept the risk and smuggle Bibles back to North Korea. When preparing for each trip, she filled her uh, pack with rice and buried um, a single Bible in the middle of it. I see. Um, after each successful crossing... Uh, she added the new Bible to a growing stack in her home. That is so clever. That woman is just so clever. I love that. Knowing that if she were caught with the Bibles, she could face imprisonment for execution, she began to worry about what to do with the Bibles. For the safety of both herself and the Bibles, she decided to wrap them in vinyl and bury them in her yard. Anji knew that uh, she might not be able to share her precious uh, but dangerous contraband for a long time. But slowly and carefully, she began to share uh, what she had learned about Jesus Christ with trusted family members who became or who came to her for food. Even distributing the food uh, required caution, as North Koreans are rewarded for reporting the neighbors who break the law. It's it's against the law to give people, give each other food. It's illegal for people to love on each other and give each other food in that nation. That's ridiculous. That, that, it, uh, it's making me very angry. It's, it's making me very angry. What is Kim Jong-ul doing? Playing with himself? 
He's such a bad leader that he had to actually ask Russia, who is in the middle of a war, for food. Anyway. So Unji waited patiently. The Bible's hidden only steps away to give God's word to anyone who demonstrated and sustained interest in receiving salvation through faith in Christ. Unji and her family um, eventually uh, defected to South Korea, and uh, she thinks that the Bibles may still be buried in the yard of her former home waiting to be discovered by another North Korean hungry for the grace of grace and hope of the gospel. Though she wasn't able to distribute the Bibles uh, before fleeing her country, Unji and many other North Koreans have discovered a life-giving importance of God's word for those hungry for the truth. Um, the North Korean believer who was at, the f was at first terrified uh, by the Bible he received um, is a testimony to its transforming power. I am not worried about it anymore, he said. If I die here, I am not going to uh, the place called a heaven because of faith. Am I not? Am I not going to the place called heaven because of faith? I only have uh, this mind. Uh, okay, give me a second. I'm sorry, I'm in a group chat. So, uh... Right now, my phone's just chirping away. I only have this mind that I want to be, or I want my beloved family and friends to go to heaven, not hell, so that I need to share uh, it with my people around with me. Um, Alright, I am giving thanks to God for letting me uh, become who I am now. I think it's time to take a break. Renegades want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform called Spotify for Podcasters, and it's all for free, and you can edit from your phone or computer all in one place. No matter what your setup looks like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available, and if you want, you can do Q&As and polls with your audience to get them involved. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and subscriptions. Best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I started using Spotify for Podcasters, I've learned that my voice is heard in many different platforms, and I absolutely love it. So, download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Let's have some fun, renegades! Alright, these are some mini stories, and I think that'll be it. So, first one is Uganda. And Uganda is one of our new listeners, so hello. Um, in Uganda, thousands of Christian converts from Islam uh, have been shunned by their communities and are unable to work in their uh, former jobs. Frontline workers and are providing job training and uh, to support uh, these new Christians. More than 200 believers graduated uh, recently from vocational training programs in sewing, cooking, uh, barbering? Oh, like barber. Okay. And metalworking. Upon completion of the training, each graduate was given a diploma and equipment needed to start his or her own business. Uh, supplies donated to the various uh, programs included sewing machines, pots and kettles, barbering supplies, and welding tools. My heart. Like, it's not just, like, showing them that 
like the love of Christ. It's also just like teaching them how to like excel in their life. Like, mm, I want to listen. Voice of the Martyrs, hire me. I will throw away my potty mouth just to get a job here. Okay, let me work for you. Describing the pressures he has faced as a new follower of Christ, one graduate said, Since I converted to Christianity, Muslims have been mocking me and belittling me for forsaking my family and um, its benefits. Uh, after receiving his graduation certificate for training in welding and metal fabrication, he said, Today I have just uh, achieved a great step in my life. I will make sure... Uh, every effort to live a better life with this skill and bring joy to my God. I pledge to train at least three other former Muslims. Thank you so much for equipping us. Um, another graduate from the tailoring program said, Life was hard and the church cannot meet all our needs because there is a lot uh, demanded by many people. Uh, with this skill, you have invested greatly in all of us. May the Lord bless you and help us to be a blessing to others. So I used to watch a lot of travel shows. So like teaching women to sew, like use a sewing machine, can really help them. I've seen a travel show where a woman actually just like was in the streets of Africa. I'm not sure where, um, like what country, but... Like, this is a business in, in Africa where they, uh, the woman will literally just pick a fabric and then they'll pick a design from the binder and then they'll be like, here, I would like this fabric with this design. And the woman will, who like has her own business, she will make that dress within a few hours and then give it to the woman who bought that design. So it is a, that's a big business. In, in Africa. So I am very, very happy that Voice of the Martyrs is doing that for Uganda. Alright, next one up is Turkey. Teen badly beaten for wearing a cross. Oh my god. When 16 year old Hakim and his family left Islam to become followers of Christ, they faced severe persecution in their home country of Iraq. Um, fearing uh, their lives, they fled to Turkey, where they now live as refugees and can worship with their Christian converts from Islam with uh, relative freedom. Really? I thought Turkey was a hostile nation. Um, Turkey has the world's population as the world's largest population of refugees, only of whom uh, fled the decade-long civil war in Syria. But some refugees, like Hakim and his family, come from neighboring countries that are hostile and uh, or to their faith. Um, and the persecution doesn't necessarily stop for uh, Christian refugees in Turkey. While walking down the street recently, Hakim was confronted by a group of men who noticed the cross around his neck. Uh, they began to punch him and smashed one of his front teeth into his gums. Oh my god, poor baby. I mean, I'm, that's terrible. My heart goes out to Hakim and his family right now. Hakim's family could not afford to treat Hakim's dental problem. So, uh... When a frontline worker heard what happened to Hakim, Voice of the Martyrs provided the funds to, for a permanent denture after a dentist repaired the tooth. Um, Hakim's pastor told uh, the frontline worker that Hakim and his family were grateful for the support they received. All right, next one is Laos, persecution for choosing a foreign religion. After hearing the gospel from Christians in their village, uh, two Laotian men, Lin and Kion, uh, called a pastor to find out how to become Christians. Though afraid of the police and knowing uh, that conversion uh, could cause them to great trouble, they accepted the pastor's invitation uh, to a Sunday worship service. 
Um, after the service, the pastor further explained the gospel to them and they placed their faith in Christ. While they were praying with the pastor, however, police officers arrived and saw what was happening. The pastor was taken to the police station, interrogated, chastised for teaching a foreign religion, and warned to stop. Then, uh, two days later, police confronted Lin and uh, about um, his... Uh, decision to follow Christ, threatening to take him to prison if he did not leave the Christian faith. But Lin stood and refused uh, to recant his faith in Christ. While more than 60% of Laotians consider themselves Buddhists, most practice a uh, synchronistic version of Buddhism mixed with tribal animism. I never heard of that. Uh, that is especially true among uh, minority tribal groups, such as the one to which Lin and Kian belong. Throughout Laos, uh, the Christian faith is viewed as a foreign threat by both Buddhist religious establishment and the communist government. Oh, I didn't know Laos was under a communist government, too. Wow. Okay. Uh, the central government restricts Christian activity and followers of Christ are also persecuted uh, by family members and village authorities concerned that Christians will offend the local spirits. All right, next one is Pakistan. Hello, Pakistan. You are one of my newest listeners. I love you very much, and this one is for you. Um, an evangelism team based in uh, Peshawar, Pakistan, conducted outreach work in many cities of the Khyber, the KPK region. I, I'm, I'm not even going to risk pronouncing that, sorry. Uh, the KPK region of uh, in the summer of 2022, telling people uh, about Christ and distributing Christian literature. The KPK region, located in the northwestern part of the country and sharing a border with Afghanistan, is the birthplace of Al Qaeda and home to Islamic extremist groups uh, like the Taliban. Okay, uh, when Islamic uh, religious leaders uh, discovered some of the Christian materials distributed uh, during the outreach efforts. Um, a, a meeting of Islamic uh, religious legal scholars called uh, Ulama uh, was, was convened to organize against evangelism. Historically, Ulamas uh, have exercised considerable power to interpret Islamic law and set uh, precedents uh, for communities uh, to deal with uh, perceived threats to Islamic faith and culture. Because of the anti-blasphemy uh, laws, Christians are at constant risk for being falsely accused of blaspheming Islam, the Quran, and Muhammad, and they receive harsh punis punishments uh, when convicted. Uh, Christians have been imprisoned for years under these laws, and many have been killed or forced to flee uh, the country upon their release. Uh, since their outreach efforts, members of the evangelism team have received threatening calls, and after learning that the police were searching for them, they dispersed to their areas uh, for their safety. And thank you so much for listening. <coughs> Sorry. I'll see you in the trenches next time.